Cool. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to Catherine for that really inspiring talk. Um, really got me in to the sphere of um, all things open. So um, hi, everyone. I'm Anne. Uh, I'm an anthropologist and I, uh, I guess a person that has a crush on data viz uh, uh, and visual storytelling. Um, I'm also an ex uh, fellow of the Open Knowledge uh, Frictionless Data Program. Um, I hope you all tuned in yesterday to fellow fellows talking frictionless tools. Um, but today I'll actually be talking about something a little bit different. Um, my co conspirator, Miriam Matheson, and I have been working on a project on supply chains for the past couple of months. Um, and today we kind of wanted to talk more about the methodology of the project and, and what it means to kind of, especially as a researcher, to kind of try and make something more engaging um, in the process of doing research. Uh, I'll tell you more about what I mean in a second. So um, over the past couple of months, uh, and really over the past number of years, um, both of us in different ways have been focused on supply chains. And just to have like a sense of shared definitions, supply chains, while I put a definition here from the ILO, it's really thought of as kind of everything something goes through uh, from its raw material all the way to its, um, its final product. Want to push back against that definition a little bit, but essentially a supply chain is kind of everything uh, in that process. All the industries, all the people, everything involved in that. You might be more familiar, of course, with these sorts of charts, right? That try and kind of take this process that's so global, that encompasses so many different things um, and puts them in much more of a visual format. Uh, makes it a lot easier to digest, right? Um, but of course, if there's anything that uh, the past year has shown us, it's that all of these supply chains are incredibly vulnerable. Well, we've seen so many maps, of course, about how uh, international trade has been totally disrupted, about how all the supply chains for everything that we use have been changed because of the pandemic. But then at the same time, while we have these kind of big picture ideas of what, um, what COVID-19 ha has done to uh, supply chains as we know them, and on also these photos of very specific um, instances or specific effects of that disruption. Uh, I especially really um, was honestly shocked by these huge piles of potatoes that were found in, in for example, in Idaho here, uh, when there was no, uh, no one to buy their potatoes. And so it, it's kind of, in many ways, it felt like we were almost going back and forth between these very, very global uh, understandings of what a supply chain is and also these very specific instances of what that disruption looks like in real time. And of course, alongside all of this were a lot of different things happening at the same time. Uh, everything from, uh, you know, protests and labor movements um, popping up worldwide as these supply chains were being disrupted, especially across the garment and delivery industries. Um, but also, you know, unofficial more forms of media popping up, like farmers joining TikTok um, clearly, I'm really into the potato photos uh, and just grabbed a couple of these from, from Twitter and from TikTok here. Um, they're really kind of, again, grounded these global things in very specific instances of just human experiences. And similarly, our interests kind of collectively um, really rose throughout the same period. So this is just a screenshot from Google's uh, like news database and showed that there was a really big spike right around this time, March through May 2020. But that kind of ever since then, there's overall a larger interest, but it goes through these oscillations, um, just like everything else, especially with the news cycle. So really, as uh, Miriam and I started talking more and more uh, during this time period, around this time last, last year, when all these stories were coming up, we were really thinking, okay, well, you know, supply chains, you know, they really only become visible to the public when they don't work. Uh, as researchers, you know, we've kind of been looking at these processes for a long time, but in a way, they've, they've always been vulnerable. Um, just enough and just on time is the uh, management mentality behind uh, supply chains. And of course, something like this was, this type of disruption on a global scale was perhaps bound to happen at some point. And of course, um, as the kind of last graph showed, Popular, popular coverage is very cyclical. And because of this, um, the gap that we were seeing in kind of what was reported on, what was put um, kind of in the news cycle was in many ways very different from what we were seeing unofficially on Twitter or on social media. Um, asked a lot of questions about, you know, who's covered, what is it? And we were wondering if there was any way to bridge this gap. 
Of course, researchers always love the CSVs, love putting everything in the spreadsheets, but these are perhaps not as impactful as photographs like this. Again, just so many potatoes. So really, um, when we started talking about, you know, possibility of doing something together related to supply chains, we were asking ourselves, you know, as researchers, how can we create this repository of information um, that is more than just, you know, a collection, but is also visually engaging, that grabs people, that, you know, impacts you in an emotional way, like photography, like database, or digital art, but is also something that we can build upon over time that is a sustainable resource. Um, and is something that, you know, could be something that we can uh, learn from as we grow over time and give us an excuse to learn from many others. And so the first step kind of in this process in a lot of ways was us very much uh, kind of experimenting with what it meant to talk about supply chains, to crowdsource a bit. Um, we joined this website called Arena and actually, funnily enough, uh, Arena is kind of like a social network for more visual, visual work and for link sharing. Very organically, people started to almost like a chain of uh, adding their own research or their own stories uh, to collections of links and resources that we were um, that we were gathering together. And in many ways, kind of got us thinking, OK, so, you know, we hear so much about the crowd. We hear so much about the, the potential for crowdsourcing. Um, it sounds like there's actually other people that are interested in this sort of research driven, but also visual at the same time. Second step uh, was writing an essay together about uh, an essay, 10 sentences, that in many ways tried to summarize uh, years of research uh, about supply chains in a way that we thought might engage humans and not other academics. Um, and that eventually became the opening page of supply chains.us. I know I haven't talked a bit about the website, but I swear that it's coming. Third step, um, after we kind of tried to, you know, ground ourselves in the, the research that we were doing, um, we thought, okay, how can we take this out in a more active way to, to people? How can we talk about something that's so global, again, so big, um, and ground it in, you know, specific instances or honestly see how people are, are thinking about it as well? Because perhaps we were too, too deep and too quickly. So this is a screenshot from the first workshop that we ran at Mozilla Fest uh, this past spring, back in March. Um, really fun, really interesting experience to just kind of gauge how everyone is thinking about these different processes. We really didn't know and who to expect, uh, who we were going to chat with. And it ended up being a bunch of different people across a bunch of different industries that very organically, you know, when, when we're, they themselves were trying to understand and ground, you know, the headlines that they were seeing in supply chains and something more concrete, um, very much started connecting between all their different brainstorms with each other. And this web in, emerged kind of organically over time. And we kept thinking, you know, this is something that we want to continue. And so pretty organically from that, uh, we started this supply chains reading group where a couple um, of us get together every two weeks uh, to talk about either a case study or a um, or a kind of larger theoretical reading in a way of that help us to understand these sorts of complex phenomena. And for us, kind of every step through this process was very much us trying to, you know, ground these processes in something very specific. But also it felt like together we were creating a sort of um, collectively creating a kind of story around our language um, that could help us to tell a story around supply chains or perhaps many other stories. Finally, uh, we're in this process, very much in this process right now, uh, but we started kind of transmitting all these things that we were co collecting um, from either peoples individually or all these different groups into just many, many spreadsheets <laughs> and are um, very much trying to create like a shared language or a way through which um, again, as researchers, we could turn them into the interest for people. So I've been a learning experience would be keen if anyone has any experience with this sort of translation, if you have any tips for us, get in touch. And then finally, um, we're right now working on kind of these two main foci. So raw materials is, and extraction economies is kind of what I focus on, um, while Miriam's much more in the transport and shipping arenas. Um, we're 
right now in the process of very organic and trying to turn them into visual material. And for us, uh, in many ways, for us kind of redefining what data viz is into visualizing information in a way that humans will like, uh, kind of changed the game for us, especially as researchers that want to get past um, papers. So just to ground it again in something real, uh, we these are a couple screenshots um, from our database that's growing slowly over time. Um, and we just actually released all of these uh, sheets open to the public. Um, so if you have anything that you'd like to input, if you have any comments, um, please, please feel free to do so. Uh, very much following in the spirit of what Catherine was saying, I think open the openness of the project is really so important for us um, because we've one learned so much from all these different public events that we've been a part of and different people and different groups that we've interacted with. But at the same time, um, it's definitely something that we would keep on doing otherwise. So again, I'm gonna say this a million times, but really I think in these sorts of projects, um, we want to try and go back and forth between these very global, like big data ideas, trade analytics, for example, to specific individual stories. This obviously is a mock-up because coconuts are not mined in Antarctica, but I think it's in many ways, it's trying to give you an example of what we mean by this, where we want to be able to put all these different types of material about supply chains in one place. So that can be something that you can explore, that you can discover, that you can kind of um, look at over time. It also grows over time. Um, and we simply just want to be stewards of that. So just to put it in a different way, uh, mixing the visual with the numerical, hopefully put together will create a format for us to you know, create more of an inclusive, decentralized way of sharing stories from and about the supply chain um, for such a, like a complex set of industries that are also very um, decentralized and global themselves. These are a couple of phases. We're now kind of somewhere between phase one and phase two. Uh, if you want to join the reading group, please get in touch. We'd love to have you. Uh, if you have any interest in getting involved in either digital art, um, do research on supply chains, uh, get involved in any way, give us some guidance on the tech side, please, please reach out. Um, but the goal is eventually to kind of, you know, we began with the technology industry, um, but really to expand into other industries. Um, I showed you all lots of photos of potatoes earlier, for example, um, food is something that's uh, something we're really interested in expanding to as well. But we kind of want to stay away from, from two things, two problems that we see with this sort of project. One is a kind of information glut. Uh, Neil Postman, who's a media theorist uh, from the late 20th century, put this really well when he said, um, pre-internet, pre-printing press in many ways, uh, we suffered collectively from a kind of information scarcity. But today we have another problem, which is the opposite, which is that we're surrounded by too much information, we're flooded with it, therefore we don't necessarily know what to do with it. And so, especially with something like supply chains or even thinking about you know, the number of headlines we were surrounded by last year, um, we wanted to make sure that you know, the experience on supply chains at us would be something that's a little bit more serendipitous, but also not overwhelming. Um, it's something that people could return back to, but at the same time, doesn't simply turn into a spectacle. I guess this is again, like maybe something that comes from the researcher instinct, but I think Bell Hooks put this really wonderfully when she talked about the analogy of the classroom, where you know even the most engaged classroom, the most engaged um, syllabi could be um, ruined by too large of a size. And so while we want to you know, grow and expand, ultimately the idea is that the quality of information, the quality of the stories, the, the types of things that we want to collect into, our, to, into this space, we want to be really intentional about, because otherwise it might just become another place of entertainment. And if another person's stories or if um, an entire industry's stories becomes nothing but a spectacle, uh, does it really help us to care about all of the people or the processes that are made invisible because of it? Yeah, so with that in mind, this is kind of what we were looking to do uh, moving forward. Um, but ultimately, just with the goal of you know, combining visual storytelling with crowdsourced research, but making sure that it's something that we can build on over time and making sure that you know, ultimately 
the goal is to not only educate, but to help people, you know, understand these processes a little bit more while we ourselves are learning more about them. I guess that's all from me. If you want to reach out, uh, feel free to send us an email at our collective email with Miriam and I, um, or reach out to me individually over email. Uh, would love to get any questions, any comments, um, critiques, anything at all, really. Miriam is also in the chat, so she'll be able to, to answer some things as well. Maybe we can get her tuned in. But thanks so much, everyone. And thank you so much for that was a really, really great and interesting talk. And we have four minutes left. So I'm just going to roll straight into asking you some questions, if that's OK. Um, cool. And the first question is, has it been easy or hard to find data about this? Because uh, I imagine that some of it's hidden or not openly available for commercial reasons. Um, easy or hard? And if hard, why hard? It's absolutely um, so, so different depending on what part of the supply chain that you're looking at. So very interestingly, I found that there was a lot of information about, uh, for example, when it came to labor uh, on the mining side of things and also the manufacturing side of things, a lot of investigative reporting going on, but everything in between, so smelting, refining, um, different parts of the manufacturing process, um, a lot of the shipping and, and um, anything related to logistics, not very reported on. Um, and so we have this huge gaps in information where literally certain types of elements would also be called something else by the time they reach another part of the supply chain. So half the work, I think, is trying to create a shared language around supply chains, or at least a language that we can operate off of and making a database that makes sense. Um, but I think actually one of the most interesting things was the types of information that we didn't expect to come across. Um, and I'm going to cite Miriam here because she uh, this always comes back to me. So she, she focuses more so on the logistics shipping side of things and was telling me about these YouTube videos and these podcasts that seamen, um, the ones who are, you know, operating the boats that move around the world, um, make about their experience, almost like vlogging. So seafarer vlogging was really big. Um, and it was cool because, you know, as someone that's, you know, reads up a lot of labor and extraction, seeing, you know, someone vlogging about their work experience, uh, like in the middle of the Pacific, I think gives you a completely different insight into what it's actually like to be within that industry. And I think it's that sort of contradiction that we really wanted to, um, yeah, that we really wanted to highlight, or at least put up on equal terms in a lot of ways. Long answer to your question, but thanks so much. That was a great one. That was a good answer. It was really interesting. Thank you. Um, we, but I'm going to ask you a question, but it's going to be a short answer if that's okay. And maybe you can yes. expand on it later in Slack. So, and it's, it's a question that I had as well, actually. So like, who's your intended audience for this type of data? And do you find you think about tailoring it towards different groups? I think for, for now in the stage that we're in, it's almost like we just want to get as much information as possible. But what's been interesting is, uh, for example, in the reading group, the people who join have different ideas of what they want to use it for. So, for example, there's very much an interest in, you know, this sort of collection being used as legal evidence, for example, or like advocacy evidence. And I think that that's something that we're definitely interested in, too. But I feel like we got to dig through the massive info first and data first. 